Hey there. Hey, buddy. You're on the air with uh, Paul, Denise, Andrew, and Allison. Allison, whose name I've had. How are you doing, sir? <laughs> I'm doing very well. Thank very well. You. Thank Hello you. Hello to all of you. Yes, thank Hello. you. We are Hello. very Hello. excited to have you on air with us. Yeah, I, very excited. I just watched your Kill or Be Killed movie last night. Oh, how'd you like it? It was quite. It was quite good. I grew up on westerns because my dad was a huge John Wayne fan. So, you know, the westerns thing is something that I've been around for a long time. But uh, yeah, it was yeah. good. My only complaint is there's, there's never enough of you in the movies. <laughs> we want more Michael <laughs> Berryman. I, I like. I, oh, thank you. I know. I know what you mean. Yeah, I saw. Uh, the, you know, the hills have eyes. Back in England when I lived there, and you were all over that movie. And you know, we got some really good. We we got some great press uh, out of UK uh, when it first went around the world, so to speak. And um, uh, it, you know, it it made a mark. I've got some really great one sheets and lobby cards. Uh, uh, double bill. It's funny what UK lobby uh, lobby cards can look like as opposed to uh, the United States. Right. Um, the lobby cards in England are beautiful. It's like me with a knife uh, holding some woman in a compromised position, but you can see her her beautiful boobs. <laughs> but in US, uh, in US, you can't show boobs, but you can show guns. In UK, you don't show guns, but you can show boobs. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I remember I actually ran a video store back when the movie came out on video, and it was one of the videos that got banned at first because everybody was freaking out about violence and everything. And then well, when, we were, that was part of the conversation. That's why we made it. Yeah, which is great. Uh, and like you say about guns, in England, you can't put a gun pointing out on a movie cover or a poster. It's not allowed. Okay. Yeah. Really? <laughs> yeah, it's bizarre. But that was that was a great movie, The Hills Have Eyes, man. You 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 came into your own in that movie. And it, yes, I, I I agree. It was right after Cuckoo's Nest. Right. Oh my right God, I love that. And um, um, I studied real hard on the set of Cuckoo's Nest and was learning about the craft. Mm -hmm. And Wes and Peter and Barry, the, our producers, directors, and writers, were you know, we were all young and just went out with with a good story and. Uh, um, it hit the mark. How much did you get to ad lib any of that stuff, or was it all pretty much on paper? Well, the, uh, the action, the action, and the uh, um, the scenes were basically storyboarded. Right. But as far as uh, everything else, uh, it was all pretty much uh, uh, ad lib. Uh, you know, um, do what you want to do. Uh, let's make it real. Right. And I and uh, which really was good. It was it was it was a very uh, tough shooting conditions. A very cold at night, hot in the day. Very limited resources. You know, we didn't have uh, a whole bunch of fancy buses. We had right. one Winnebago. <laughs> that, that, that was everything. You know, uh, green room, makeup, wardrobe, uh, production office, and uh, catch a nap if you can. And also, uh, we're cooking on this little tiny stove in this Winnebago <laughs> for the whole company, which is about maybe. 25, 30 people on any given day. Wow. So it was real guerrilla uh, um, filmmaking, and it was it was fun. It was it, it was really great. I, I would imagine great. that those days were uh, more fun than making movies now, right? Uh, they can be. It's a different era. We had just um, come into our own. I think horror was out of the carnival show kind of circuit, you know, right. the kind of way people looked at it, you know, what, what is art? Okay, what's horror? Well, you got, you got Karloff and the Mummy and Lugosi, et cetera, and then mm -hmm. you know, where where are we at today? We didn't really have any good, gritty horror. We had kind of uh, sleaze and slash. Right. Uh, you know, uh, uh, almost a Mondo kind of filmmaking, uh, late 40s, early 50s, and then by the time Hills came around, um, I would say the the media and 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 uh, film was pretty uh, socially uh, comment social commentary societal commentary and that's what Wes really brought to the table uh, right. of course the, I, the I parallel remember. between the two families you know I remember and, and how they see things I remember Last House on the Left that was one of the really oh, notorious God. movies in England that Wes Craven did. But, uh, that movie is is so intense. Uh, uh, I can only watch it like about once every ten years. And, <laughs> and, I mean, if you've seen it once and it's affected you, it's like, okay, yeah, no, I don't need to see it again. Right. I'm, <laughs> it's I'm very a, powerful. Yeah, I'm a big fan of like 
the, the kind of special effects you guys had down back then that they were kind of crude and bloody and stuff. What do you feel about when they remake these movies and make them all high tech and stuff? Doesn't that take away from the original? Well, I think it's a, I, no, I don't believe it takes away from the original at all because the original is a separate piece and does stand on its own, and and it has its own effect through time. Mm -hmm. uh, and by that I mean uh, all of the new audiences that that see the original Hills Have Eyes for the first time right. in whatever decade. Now we're in the 21st century. Okay, um, so it always has its original effect on whatever the uh, the viewing audience may be uh, throughout time. So I, 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 I used to kind of feel not offended, but like mm -hmm. irritated, like, oh, why did they bother right. on remakes? And, 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 and now I understand, you know, I understand um, why they do remakes, but uh, I'm always one for write your own original story. Right. It can be similar to something else or even an homage, but um, to redo the exact same uh, timeline, um, yeah. I'm not going to say don't do it because right. if you if you have any project that gets funded and into production, mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm all for that. Right. <laughs> but I mean, you, you know, <laughs> people people don't realize that. Uh, well, why? How should they? That you know, the film industry and storytelling industry, it's not like I just cooked a burger and someone's going to buy it. Right. Exactly. Right. I just feel that you know some people get to see the remake first and they don't get to experience. You know the—I don't want to say—you know, like low budget, but just the way it's made. You know, it was—it was very hard to make it. They pieced it together and made it for like twenty-five thousand dollars in the middle of the woods. You know, it's just—it just has a, such a different feel to me. I mean, and why do they remake good movies? I, I've asked everyone who's an actor that's been on this show. Can you explain to me why they're remaking good movies? Why can't they remake movies that are bad and make them good? <laughs> 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 That's a very interesting uh, uh, perspective. Right. Um, <laughs> um, I think it's money, right? I think money. How much money they make? It's fucking great. <laughs> I think a lot of a lot of uh, projects that get re that get a green light. Right. Um, I would say maybe thirty percent of the the reason a project gets gets um, green lit and you're in production is because of the producers and the investors. Mm -hmm. And if you get, and if that happens as a process, that's wonderful. Right. Uh, the, the, the other two thirds are, of course, uh, the ability of your, of your company and staff and crew and actors to do justice to your intention. And, 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 the, and the intention, of course, comes from the concept of who created it, and that's the writer, the, uh, the third right. part. And occasionally you get all three uh, in sync, and that gets your your final edit as a story the way you you envisioned it. Um, but um, I think the big I picture is a the, lot of the time it's 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 a sure bet to make money. Exactly. So that's why they do uh, a remake now right. to take a, a a bad movie and make it good. I think that's been attempted. Right. Um, uh, like you could. And if Charlie hears this, I love you, Charlie. If, if you take a Charlie <laughs> Band movie right. and, 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 and make it better, it's like, okay, uh, if, I did a tro if, if you did a trauma movie and then you did it better, you'd have a Charlie Band movie. Mm -hmm. If you took a Charlie Band movie and you did it a little bit better, you might have a Wes, Wes Craven slash uh, um, uh, the guy who did, uh, well. Sam Raimi or something? Oh, yeah, I was Sam Raimi. I was thinking more along the lines of weird science. Uh, oh, John Hughes. Uh, John Hughes. John yeah. Hughes, thank you, thank you. Yeah. So, so um, uh, if that's your intention and it's at a certain level, then, then enjoy it for what it is. Like, I love Evil Dead, for instance. It's right. not a scary love movie. It. It's in your face, and the effects are very shocking, but I don't find it uh, scary or threatening. I find it thoroughly enjoyable. Yeah, I, <laughs> it's I, I, my favorite drive-in movie. We, yeah. When we had our video store, we actually got took to court for having Evil Dead because they thought it was obscene. And we, we're sitting in the court. <laughs> uh, yeah, I know, right? And we're sitting in the room, and they're playing the movie really? for the jury. This actually went to a jury, would you even believe? And oh one, my God. one woman turned green, one of the jurors, and me and my friend Colin, who owned the store, were like, she turned green, she turned green and we're like, we are fucked. 
don't give a bark We bag. are fucked. We're going to jail. <laughs> yeah, because in England, the video Nasty Scare, they just released all the unedited versions of all these, you know, horror, beam, whatever you want to call them, movies. And they just, just put them out on video where on, in the movies, movies were censored. So the movie theater would get the censored one, but on video, you'd get the uncensored one, like Zombie Flesh Eaters or uh, yes. Nightmares in a Damaged Brain, all those kind of movies. So mm -hmm. everybody in England was getting took to court saying that it was obscene and somebody actually went to jail for 18 months for having what? the nightmare on a damaged brain movie which is pretty oh up. my good that really? is a long time a yeah wow because yeah. like, i remember i think the worst movie that i've ever seen when i was a kid and that's what i said barf bag they gave out barf bags the exorcist no it was called mark a mark of the, of the devil. devil and i'll tell you something that night i came home and i did nothing but shake the whole entire night because it was just a, yeah. a, a movie about nothing but tortures. Like, you're pulling your tongue but out, movies, Chinese water torture. I mean, it was but movies back then, burning witches to the they were done to, to do that to you. They were done for the effect, you know? And it's it's those yeah. kind of... I, I love those movies. I'm a, I, The Hills Have Eyes, you know, uh, all those movies are just, to me, are uh, just so much better. I have a whole hard drive of all the different movies I've downloaded from, you know, Amazon or, what, or YouTube or iTunes or whatever. I have all the. I have so many of those old movies. I love them to death. I I, I could watch The Hills Have Eyes fifty times. I'm See, sorry. And I grew up with my parents loving Hitchcock. Yeah. All of oh, I grew movies. up on Hitchcock too. Exactly. Right. And to me, I didn't find them scary. But they're more suspenseful, aren't they? But now, like they Bates Motel. Suspenseful. Yeah. Okay, ba Bates Motel. And clever. Motel, right. Which is, you know, a series after, after that, Psycho. Right. To me, I'm finding like, oh my god. I'm like seeing just the whole like psycho thing in a different light. Ma are you watching? TV series. Are you watching Bates Motel, Mike? I have not seen. Uh, I have not been watching that. I've been watching oh my Lucifer. God, you've watch oh, it. Lucifer! That's pretty good. Very good. Yeah, that's pretty good. There's a. It's also a Damien. Yeah. I haven't actually watched it myself, but there's a that's Damien. Coming, yeah, Damien's yeah. coming out. That's I haven't. Uh, I've seen some of the ads for that. I'm pretty much watch. Um, uh, we, well, we have all the all of the seasons of Supernatural. Right. I like Supernatural. Uh, I like uh, uh, Lucifer is is a lot of fun. I like uh, um, Warren Bodies is hilarious. Right. And I I also like uh, um, the Vampire and the Werewolf and the Ghost. It's off the air now. Right. Lives in the base. Adrian, what the heck was his name? I know um, what you mean, but I don't remember what it's called. Yeah, uh, that was good. Very good writing. Good writing. Um, I, I got to see The Hills Have Eyes at a drive-in with Wes and Peter Locke and Barry Kahn. We were in a van. That's got to be awesome. And oh, yeah. we're watching the movie. It's in Los Angeles in the San Fernando Valley. Right. And they um, they had me put on my, my Pluto wardrobe <laughs> with, uh, <laughs> with knife, knife and, and everything and moccasins and oh my God. necklace. And when when the family has to realize that they um, have no choice but to fight back, and, and that was the crux of the moral issue right. between the characters in the writing, and so they had to he uh, they had to do that. It's just like the end of the Last House on the Left. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, uh, you have to match the intensity of, of the attack, so to speak. So. The guys said, hey, what, Michael, why don't you go bang on a few car windows? Oh, my God. See what I, you know what? I was just picturing oh, that. I would be freaked out. <laughs> what kind of reaction did you get? Well, I thought at the time, I was like, uh, I think I was like 26, maybe, or, you know, and I, and I figured, yeah, sure, why not? You know, it's like my third <laughs> third movie right after Cuckoo's Nest, and, and it's actually getting shown around town, and I get to be part of the publicity, and, wow, this is kind of fun. And Okay, sure. Well, um, I don't know, second or third car, I, I pounded on the window and went boo. The gal screamed in her gigantic muscled boyfriend with a baseball bat <laughs> that you scared my girlfriend and started chasing me. And I'm going, oh, man, I do have a knife, but I don't want to hurt this guy. Oh, yeah. geez. So I'm basically running to the van. And I see the headlights <laughs> and the motor starts up and they're, they're going down the aisle and this guy's chasing me and Wes and Peter open the sliding door and I literally jump in the van like right out of a <laughs> eight team scene and and we leave the guy in the dust and, and we're driving out the driveway onto the Rashida Boulevard and I go, We're laughing like a bunch of kids. I go, what was that about? you know and and we wind up going to some diner and 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 
just chatted up about you know that we had we might have a hit here and because right. it, it really affects audiences I've seen people go in to screenings at shows and, con- and conventions where they go oh they're all jaded they go oh, this movie's nothing it's right. old school no fancy effects blah 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 and toward the end you, it, it it grabs you every single time I don't care what what um you know, every what decade of viewer um, over time, it's been over 30 years, and you know what? It still has a visceral effect. Absolutely. So, you know what? Well, it was well done. I wonder if anyone actually ever told those people that they chased the real Pluto <laughs> down the street. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I'm surprised don't know. it hasn't popped up on Facebook. Right. <laughs> right. Hey, remember the night? Yeah. 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 The guy, they didn't recognize you, even though you, you, you looked exactly the same as the dude on the screen. <laughs> yeah, I don't age. I know. I wish that was true. <laughs> so I wanted to go back to like when you started getting into the movies and that. You know, when you were a kid, I'm assuming you, you had a pretty hard time with the kids at school, right? Well, anyone with a with a visual obvious difference, uh, you, you know, aside from maybe somebody who stuttered, they would be in the same boat. Right. Yeah, yeah kids are yeah. kids are mean. You know, and kids <laughs> kids look at the obvious, and if it's a uh, they don't know how to process it, they're going to behave in certain ways that they've been socially taught by their parents and stuff. Right. So, yeah, I had my fair share of bullshit, and uh, yeah. you, know, you grow out of it over time, and you, know, you get in a few fights once in a while, and. Uh-huh. Overall, you kind of get a life, and and you know after you graduate, most ninety percent of those people are not in your life anymore. So, exactly. yeah, I, um, it was you know pretty straightforward, obvious stuff. You know. Have you have you ever met anyone at a convention or on Facebook that you remember gave you a hard time, but now they're your best friend? No. <laughs> No, I wouldn't want. No, that, that that's a Disney movie. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've I've no, had, I, I've, had I've never uh, I've never had that experience, and uh, um, no, hasn't happened. So what were you? Doing? I'm sure, I'm sure people have you know. Uh, I mean, everybody teases or gets boy whatever over time. I'm sure that you know they all moved on and matured right. and yes. forgot about it, and uh, and maybe a few wound up you know screwing their life up and, you know, getting getting thrown in jail or something, whatever. But um, I don't, uh, I I personally, I I don't need that. uh, Right. uh, Hey, anybody of your, uh, uh, remember the time with, I've I've moved on. I trust you. I trust your life for two years. Here's one beer. It's going to make up for it. (laughs) (laughs) So what, what, what did you do before you started acting? Well, I went to college, uh, Cal- University of California in San Luis Obispo for f- uh, five years. I was in the area for about six or seven years. Um, studied art history and uh, um, well, uh, some uh, veterinary science. Wow. Uh, didn't wind up with a, a finished degree. It was toward the end of the Vietnam War. I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do. All right. I worked in a lot of different fields, from a taxi driver to uh, restaurants, uh, chef, all that kind of stuff. And I wound up in, I left college in 73, went to Washington State because a friend's house had burnt down. And huh. I joined a friend of mine uh, from grammar school, who was a lifetime, lifetime friend, uh, University of San Francisco uh, economics professor. Anyway, uh, we went up and helped build this, our friend's house. Wow. We were in our mid-20s and in great shape and in Puget Sound on an island building a, lo- a two-story log cabin. Nice. We did that for about three months, and then it was finished. It was beautiful. I was going to homestead in Alaska because I just love the mountains and I love nature photography and, you know, living out in the woods is just delightful to me. So I came back to L.A., went to Venice Beach, had a friend who had a little, uh, it was, they, she sold like house plants and the local artist would hang stuff on her wall, we'd sell them on commission and um, knickknacks and a little bit of this and a little bit of that, incense, whatever. It, it was, you know, hit, uh, post-hippie days, Venice right. Beach. So one day a gentleman walked into our shop and he identified himself as George Powell. And his son and daughter-in-law owned the antique store right across the street from us. So we kind of knew 
the rest of their family. Well, I knew that George had produced War of the Worlds, and I right. said, wow, you made War of the Worlds. And he handed me a business card that said Warner Brothers Studios and his name, and he said, uh, well, call my office. You're, you're, you're interesting to, to talk with, and also you look like um, a person that could play the part of the coroner in Doc Savage, The Man of Bronze. So I went to his office, and he hired me, and he gave me uh, my uh, two-day Taft-Hartley contract so I could join the um, Screen Actors Guild Union. Right. And I had a few hundred bucks in my pocket and a union card. Nice. And George gave me wow. my start just by accident. Well, having a, had an art degree, mm-hmm. uh, you know, film is arty, so I said, sure, why not? Because I'd yeah. done every other kind of job imaginable uh, from washing dishes to taxi cab to a butcher to tree climber with chainsaws, you name it. I've done just about all kinds of stuff. Mm-hmm. So this, I didn't think would turn into a career, but George had a casting director that was casting another project, and they called me in on that, and I met Michael Douglas, Saul Zanz, Milos Foreman, and Joel Douglas, uh, who were directing, writing, and producing One Flew Over Cuckoo's Nest. So I said, sure, I'll, I can't have Tell me where, give me my plane ticket, I'll be there. Right. And, and, and that was day mm-hmm. two for me. Mm-hmm. Wow. And all the way up to day 128. Wow. That was wow. my second gig. It was a lot longer than the first one. <laughs> so, did you, you just had a natural acting ability, or did you have to, like, learn the craft? Well, that's a good question. That's a very honest question. Uh, everyone, I believe, has a natural acting ability. Right. The, the degree to which you're... Um, you're in the zone and you are the character with your own personal tools as a human and how well you perform is another. Those are all different steps and different skills. So the first, uh, so yes, I, I had a natural ability to talk to total strangers because I had total strangers talk to me when I was a child right. and, and a young man and a teenager with a visual difference and or just in, you know, talking to people in general, but the the wrapping on, on, on the package was always what people saw first because right. they couldn't right. avoid it. Right. So that was something that, you know, you, you deal with. I've worked with many groups with different types of disabilities, spatial, cranial, et cetera, et cetera, mm-hmm. Paul Newman and a lot of other groups. So that I knew was obvious. My father was a brain surgeon, my mother a nurse, so I was very aware of um, my position, but the tools and the skills that uh, uh, young people and kids and anyone uh, right. um, need to get better at certain tools. Well, you don't have those tools available. The doctors will give you a pill, do a procedure, mm-hmm. but in our society, we don't have that kind of medical care or it just isn't always there. Right. And a lot of it you just have to experience and kind of fumble your way through. Yeah. And... Um, and, and and that's okay. It's called life, you know. So, um, uh, so that you know what got me in the, in the industry was a, a visual difference, and 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 then also the experiences of being uh, Ellis, the lobotomy patient, right? Nest, right. With Ellis being the McMurphy prior to his lobotomy. Uh, and I knew the story very well. I'd seen the play many times. Okay. I saw one version in L.A. with R- Woody Strode as uh, Chief Bromden and uh, William Duvain as uh, McMurphy. It was at the Pasadena Playhouse, and, and it was phenomenal. It was phenomenal. Um, I, I, I remember talking to Michael Douglas and asking him if the hallucinations that were in the Kesey novel of the of the chief and the floor falling beneath and Ellis uh, and all of that and uh, they said uh, no it had to be more concise because the drafts that were being sent for production uh, for shooting script from Ken Kesey were 300 pages they were novels they weren't a screenplay so that took right. a long period of time for the writers and the lawyers and the permissions to tell the story. And uh, Ken was not happy that the chief was not the main character. <laughs> he didn't, uh, he, McMurphy was subsequent to the, to the chief's uh, uh, situation. But I thought Will Sampson did a fine job uh, in the moments that we did have the chief 
um, um, carrying the story and the conflict, like especially right. when he has to uh, suffocate Jack Nicholson. So it was a, um, uh, an incredible experience. I mean, um, it was the highlight of my career, up to, even up to this point. What was it like working with Jack Nicholson? When I first met Jack, it was on the first day of um, wardrobe and makeup. And Fred Phillips, who whose father started the Makeup Artist Union, was my mentor. And every morning I would go to Fred Phillips and he would do my lobotomy scars and he would tell me stories about Hollywood, different actors and famous And he was the classiest of the classiest. He'd work with old Hollywood and everybody. He he created Spock's ears. Wow. So uh, he kept me very grounded as a young man in a new industry. My day two was, you know, on location, away from home, in a hotel, six days a week, 100 hours a week, one day off, and just like, wow, where am I? And uh, it, it was kind of overwhelming. But when I met Jack, um, he came in to have his lobotomy scars, um, um, you know, dialed in, and we we had our first conversation, and he, I found him to be very grounded, very uh, spry, so to speak, and really, really honest. Wow. Uh, and 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 you know, it's it's, it's right there. Uh, he tells it like it is, kind of guy. Um, hit it off. I mean, we're good buddies. I remember. Um, when we wrapped, I'd come back to L.A. maybe a year or two after we had wrapped. I was at a club in, in Hollywood with a friend of mine, and we were upstairs in this little tiny uh, landing at, above the stage. There's like maybe two tables. And then uh, uh, another place over where the lights are off the catwalk was another little private sofa, and you couldn't see who the people were there. Mm -hmm. Well, the lady comes over, and there's a... Uh, Places puts down the two drinks, you know, and I, and he goes, oh, these are from uh, from Jack, and then I hear Jack in the darkness. I hear his voice calling out to me, and it was, it was, it was Nicholson. So we went over and said hi, and uh, Jack's just a straight up guy. He he wow. told me that if he had been as tall as I was, <laughs> that he would have gone for a career on in the NBA because uh. he loved that. <laughs> so he took you under his wing, right? I mean, as a new He's actor. Still humorous. <laughs> As a new actor, yeah, he was. Uh, he was. Uh, Jack was approachable. Uh, he had a lot on his plate, so he was pretty busy. I would say ninety percent of the time. But moments where we would have a chance to just sit, like, we'd be sitting down, we would take a break. So most of the time, he, he would be. About half the time, he'd be in his tra in his trailer, you know, uh, right. chilling out, and having a bite to eat. Uh, um, most of the the rest of the time, you know, he would be sitting hanging with us and Scatman Crothers and Danny and and. Uh, um, his buddy from Colorado, uh, one of the wheelchairs is on tire. Um, I mean, that's Ben T, the other guy. Um, when Jack takes, uh, there's a scene in Cuckoo's Nest where Jack takes this kind of big guy, he's kind of like pushing against his cheek with his tongue, and Jack turns him around, and Nicholson says, come on, buddy, this could be a good break for you. Well, what he, that was not scripted lines. Huh. And then he rolls past the camera and, and, and out of the scene. What Jack was really doing was talking to this good buddy who was from Colorado, who Jack likes to go skiing with, mm. uh, an old friend from college, uh, I believe. And uh, he, he's actually saying, you're going to be guaranteed a close-up that won't be edited out of the movie, and maybe this will get you more work. That's what he meant when wow. he says those lines. So next time you see Cuckoo's Nest, you'll see Jack turn around from getting the medication. So, Come on, buddy, this could be a good good moment for you <laughs> it's, it's nice so uh, yeah. it's nice it's that he takes life care of his imitating friends. art <laughs> it's, it's nice that he takes care of his friends like that that's well that's true yeah that's true i have i i hold jack in very high regard i really do and i i pity the fool that, that uh. ever uh, <laughs> that ever um is disrespectful to his daughter <laughs> one of my, one of my uh, favorite nicholson roles was uh, the witches of eastwick Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, he was he was nuts in that too, <laughs> you know. Yeah. So did yeah, you no, guys? Have, I like a that's a good movie. Did, a you, the... did you guys have any idea how big that movie was going to be when it came out? Yes. Because Jack Nicholson. And I'll was tell you why. I'll tell you why. Because every day on the set, and I was on the set 128 days. 
six days a week, and I spent every 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 minute on the set because I was getting questions answered from mm-hmm. the cinematographer to right. the lighting crew to the camera operator. I was learning my craft. I was learning why you put the tape down or the four marks. What does it mean? You know, show me. Fo- I mean, I remember when Milos Forman. I, I asked him. I said in the very beginning, I said, "What do I need to know?" that I don't know now that can help help you use me as a, you know, a part, a, 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 you know, paint for your canvas. Right. And he brought me over to the camera. It was a Panavision 35 millimeter. And he, um, he had me sit in a chair and I got to look through the lens for the very first time, which I've done many times wow. before, and, and focus and pan and just... And I asked the... Well, here's... He, he he said, "I want you to look at the glass." Mm-hmm. He stood me at first. He stood me in front of the lens, this beautiful, gorgeous camera, and I'm looking at it. And he goes, "This captures everything. Yeah, right. It sees everything." And he says, "The best way I can tell you how to work with this tool, this camera, is I want you to have a love affair with the glass." What is your feeling on the the film versus video? conversation the what you know some people say the that what? film is so much better than video you know people are using digital now oh well uh, uh i'm a big fan of film right. uh, i like print film best video's gotten better and better and better but, uh, and and there's definitely a need for it and use for it yes right. and i appreciate i appreciate it very much uh especially like the, the new uh, the new sony 35 so you can shoot video and, and they're getting better so you can shoot extended footage well, I prefer film for its translucency. Right. I prefer film for the chiaroscuro effect, uh, you know, in a color man, the gray, you know, the gray tones, and also you have more texture. Um, I don't like uh, uh, high definition television at all. No. It, I don't like it at all. It, it's so unnecessary. Right. It's like you know, back in in the old. Uh, I remember when the Hammer films were coming out. I go. Well, they're they're grainy, but they were cool. Okay, and then you had um, like uh, the movies that, like when Cuckoo's Nest first came out, it, it was kind of soft and fuzzy. That was mm-hmm. that was kind of the cinematographer's right. issue. I, I mean, it, it's it, it's just so duly noted. Um, but so people wanted um, better, more sharpness. Well, okay. Um, they got better lighting, et cetera, and then it went way too far. I think the high def is uh, is almost annoying. It takes away from the story. Now you now you it got 4K coming out. You, 4 4K mm-hmm. is four times the definition of high def, so it's going to be getting crazy. Yeah, but what's the purpose? Uh, I mean, the only reason for the, for that kind of sharpness, I suppose, would be if you were doing miniatures and you were shooting outer space scenes. You know, right. If you were out in, you know, otherwise, I, I just think it's, you know, please, you know, please take it as far as you can, bump against the wall, and then right. come back to reality. I, I think it's a gimmick. I think it's just a marketing tool, honestly. Yeah, because you have to buy well, every yeah. movie five times. Every time something new comes out, you have to go get the 4K. Well, version. there you go. Yeah. I mean, there's the, there's the, the, that's a financial yeah. decision. That's a marketing decision to sell more products, to sell more machines to, uh, I'm more interested in the art and the story, and 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 if the visual, it, it's basically for video games and it's just got and everything else, in my opinion. Right? Yeah, um, I, I believe that too. Do you? you I, I, I mean, assume, I, go ahead. I was going to say, I assume because you you like film over video, you you like the old LP records more than CDs too, right? Well, some CDs actually uh, are 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 uh, have some good. Uh, um, Texture to them. It, a lot depends on your speakers. Like, for, for instance, uh, the surround sound that you have with these little tiny ceramic speakers that are very small and they're highly driven. Mm-hmm. They have no depth. Right. I would rather have an, a folded horn Altec Lansing voice at the theater. Two of those in my house, and it would fill the entire house wow. with some warmth and textures. Um, so I, it comes down to what kind of an ear you have, but uh, mm-hmm. I really prefer analog. And yes, I, I was at a party uh, with some friends a long time ago. Anyway, I had met um, 
Mitchell Davis. So Mitchell Davis is Clive Davis' son. We were at one of the Coppola's uh, uh, homes. So some other people were having a, um, a party. We were invited. And, well, and so I had a conversation uh, with uh, Mr. Davis about about uh, recordings. And I told him how, you know, the, uh, the tapes were great. Uh, but I like uh, LPs. And uh, he says, don't worry. He says, they're analog has been rediscovered and you'll start seeing LP pressings again. Right. And lo and behold, that was about 10, uh, 11 years ago. Wow. And, and, and now they're back. Turntables are back because people rediscovered an, uh, an older technology that was totally fine. Right. Yep. Yep. Totally like fine. Yeah, if you go to the and, and it has a warmth. It has a warmth. And, and it has a different effect. Right. And, uh, and uh, I really, really like it a lot. I like widescreen. I like as, aspect ratios that really give give value to um, to the scene. What's going on in the scene? You know, because just tight back and forth close ups, you know, prime lens shots between your main characters gets really boring. You know, I, I, uh, if, if if for an example of what I'm talking about, go back and watch the widescreen version of Lawrence of Arabia. Right. And you'll see extended, long dolly shots that last almost up to a minute. Right. And on regular and, and, TV, that pattern is right? And so. that will give you the, the feeling of what that type of filmmaking is as opposed to, you know, other, other styles. I happen to like that style a lot. Right. I'd imagine that those would look better in high def because of the resolution you need. Because if you play that on, like, an old VHS tape... The resolution was so poor. Oh, I agree. Yeah, yeah. the v, uh, yeah, a lot of the VHS, t a lot of VHS is softer and it's not as. Uh, I do like the CDs, but I don't like high def, high def TVs. Um, something less than your standard high def today, it, it, it gives it a more realistic look. You know, um, so I think a lot of it depends on you know what you're watching, like. Uh, Blade Runner in its original version is beautiful to look at. Don't change a thing. <laughs> right, exactly. So, do you feel that once you got those big roles, you know, The Hills Have Eyes and One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, that people started to look at you as an actor and not just because of how you look? Well, no. Uh, there is there is a point where people got to to appreciate the performance. That's what I'm go, saying. Yeah. Exactly. Oh yeah, this awesome. guy fits, That's what and, I meant, and, yeah. and and yeah, he's he's more than just you know, the visual package. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. Um, I wonder, uh, and that's unique for me, so it did help. Right. Uh, as far as social awkwardness, perhaps. Uh, and it's nice to see where that has uh, progressed from, uh, I mean, Kirk Douglas could not get Cuckoo's Nest made because they, nobody wanted a movie about the stigma of mental illness. Right. and. In society, no, we we survived the atom bomb, World War II, we we prevailed, life is perfect, science is God, and none of that was true. Right. <laughs> you know, if it's not humanity first, then um, what's the point? Right. So uh, I, I felt more comfortable in my skin at that point, right. for sure. And I could make it, you know, I, and I got to where he, over time I didn't have to have odd jobs. I, I right. could pursue it as a career and a livelihood. And for most uh, uh, actors, for instance, uh, that's a very rough statistic to climb up that ladder. Right. Um, I think about 5% make 90% of the revenue. Yeah. I mean, I mean, of all, you, the, you've of all the members of our union, for instance. Yeah. So, so you've 100 percent proved that you're an actor and not just a, a, a you know a, a character that people recognize. Like a lot of the movies you've done are all different, and you're doing all kinds of different acting. You know what I mean? You're thank not, you. For, yeah. You, yes. Thank you. You're not just typecast into that one thing. You know, I'm sure that's how well, it was at the start, but after a while, people realize that you know you're a very talented actor. Well, thank you. I appreciate the observation. You are you are keenly wise. <laughs> <laughs> all of you, um, and you know. Um, it happens to everyone, actors and non-actors, but uh, a, a dear actor friend of mine, Kane Hodder, he and I did a movie together called um, Ed Gein, The Butcher of Plainsfield. Mm -hmm. And we had, our, we had our first scene where we had ever been in the movie together in a scene where we're in the truck and, and I'm explaining to him, you know, you got to stop killing these people and why do you do it? And I'm your best friend. And, of course, he kills me with a shovel and 
Mm-hmm. But the scene plays out. Um, we had a really good conversation with the uh, with our DP and director, and and they got the lighting and the lens right, so it's nice wide prime lens, and you can really see the expression on his face. And he was like giddy, like a little kid. He's going, man, this is like one of my first acting roles where the camera's going to be on me, and they can. Yeah. I'm a little nervous. This is Kane. It's like, oh, uh, I said, well, it'll it'll be kick ass. So we talked over a few notes, and we we drove the truck up to, and we park it, and then we have our dialogue, and then the exterior shots, and and it's a really good dramatic scene. And so for it was great uh, for Kane, and it was a, just a joy for me to experience a good friend's first breakout from how you look. And of course, he did a lot of stunts where people didn't know who, what what he looked like, but right. but for Kane, it was a really good acting dramatic scene as opposed from what you know you're typecasting him oh he's got you know he looks this way therefore right. he can only be the bad guy in a killer. Right. and and so there is some good humanity in that character Kane Hodder in the Ed Gein movie so uh, yes it, it, it is a um, it is a metamorphosis in, in a sense it, it, it's a travel through time through through art which is lovely and if the check don't bounce, yeah. my wife is happy. <laughs> so you mentioned, and that, I'm happy. So you mentioned Cuckoo's Nest. I'm being happy. You, you said you were, you're pretty proud of, of being the Cuckoo's Nest movie. You're very proud of that. What other movies and TV stuff have you done that you're really, really proud of the, the performances? Well, I, I, I'm extremely fond of the footage that you'll never see from The Crow as Skull <laughs> Cowboy with, with Brandon Lee. There were some very intimate scenes that we were supposed to get on film that we had practiced together in his uh, motorhome, he and I, uh, where Eric Draven is confronted by the Skull Cowboy three times to remind him that uh, the blood will not go back into your body. You will not heal every time you're shot. Uh, you kill the ones that killed you both, and then you will be reunited with your beloved. Huh. And... Um, Matter of fact, there is uh, some extra footage that you can see on one of the double DVD, the DVDs of The Crow. You can't quite hear the dialogue. And the book uh, uh, called um, The Making of The Crow, K- Kitchen Sink Press uh, publisher, there is a, a chapter called On the Cutting Room Floor, and it's dedicated to my character, the Skull Cowboy. And there's some great pictures in there. Um, and um, I'm very, very proud of, of of that role, even though you don't get to see my performance. But I had a, I had the opportunity to meet and work with Brandon Lee, which was uh, just uh, wonderful. Right. And I and and then also getting to know David Scow, who wrote the screenplay, and also of course uh, um, uh, help me out the. Uh, James, uh, James Obar, okay. a very, very good friend. And so when you can work on a project that that has that much um, real human uh, experience and suffering and redemption in it, it's more valid than just, you know, a bunch of writers sitting down and it's crank out a movie. Right. Uh, it's very, very uh, special to me. As far as performance, um, my X-Files season three Revelations is the episode where I play the people think I'm the scary guy that, that takes the kid out of school and brings him to his house. He's actually the caretaker for his parents' uh, landscaping, but he's also his guardian angel. Right. And at the end, uh, I die. I give my life to protect the boy from the devil, and I do. I do die, and then in, in the autopsy room, well, in, in just the hospital, Scully and Mulder are discussing. A reversal of their roles, mm-hmm. right? Where David is not a believer, and 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 uh, Jillian is. I I bump into Jillian every 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 year or so at different shows, and mm-hmm. it's always great to to uh, talk to a friend that uh, we had a chance to be in a scene in, in something that actually uh, has high value and good merit. You know, it, it was great to work with them. I was I nailed it. It, it was just a great. Uh, great episode and um, working with Leonard Nimoy uh, right. was really uh, very special 
Um, and I'm also very, very proud of the um, high school principal that I play in the Motley Crue video, oh, right, Smoking right. in the Boys Room. Right, I remember that. <laughs> yeah, I remember that. Now that one I know. Come on, that, that, that was the most requested like... video on MTV <laughs> for over a year. Wow. As a matter of fact, I was doing the voice, some voiceover work for uh, some movie. I don't remember what the movie was. But while we were getting everything set up, the guy at the recording studio had a um, call sheet for himself where he had to go to work and put soundtrack here or dub this voice or change this dialogue track. And on the work order, it said, um, Motley Crue smoking in the boys' room, um, ear wiggle, three seconds, <laughs> insert. So what had happened was, at the end of the, uh, of the video, smoking in the boys' room, uh, Nikki reaches in and takes my wig off, and I turn around the camera and wiggle my ears, and, and like, huh? in exasperation and shock and surprise. And that's very funny. And then I wiggle my ears. Well, for some reason, MTV, after many, many, many months, cut the ear wiggle out to save time for whatever reason. Huh. And people phoned in and wrote and complained. Huh. So much so that he had to, one day at work, take the ear wiggle from that old song video and put it back in so it can still be played on MTV because people demanded it. And I said, you're kidding. He says, wow. no, I, I, I saved the original work. I figured someday I might run into you, and here it is. Yeah. And I still have it in my scrapbook today. So I'm very, very proud of my ears. <laughs> <laughs> Now, I, I see that you said that you, you're very interested in what goes on behind the camera. I see that you've associate produced a couple of movies. Do we, are we ever going to see any movies directed by Michael Berryman? Yes, I believe so. I'm, uh, Ooh, awesome. I'm, moving, um, I'm moving to Colorado, and I have an uh, autobiography I've been working on, but I have some uh, short stories that uh, uh, I, I am going to be... Uh, this winter, they'll be completed as far as uh, the scripts, and um, then I'm going to uh, have a lot of friends um, in the industry, and and, uh, and then we'll be uh, my Christmas present to myself this year is to uh, pitch a couple uh, short ideas. Um, there is a gentleman in Arkansas. His name is Jesse Burke. He's an orthopedic surgeon, and um, He's a great guy, and in his spare time, he likes to do little shorts, kind of like uh, Rod Serling. Uh, matter of fact, he won some awards for the first one. Um, first one. Uh, well, the second one is called Cured. You, okay. can, you can Google it. Right. Uh, Jesse Burke, yes. and it's called Cured, and okay. he makes these wonderful little short uh, films. And uh, the first one we did was... Uh, I'm, a, I'm the creepy ice cream man, the price of an uh, ice cream. He's one of your parents' fingers. Um, uh, just Google Jesse Burke. You know, right, I can't okay. We'll check that out right after. Now. Definitely. We'll but it, it's fun. You know, little moments can be big scenes. Right, absolutely. The, the, like, like you said, the ear wiggle was three seconds long, and everybody remembered that out of the whole song and the whole video. Well... They like the song, too, but right. they, that part's really funny. I, I had people for years, they still come up to me and go, can you still, can you wiggle your ears? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's yeah. funny. Um, Do you, now, you enjoy meeting fans at the conventions, right? Very much, very much. Uh, I get incredible fan mail, and um, uh, I've met, you name it, from, I've met people at conventions that, First met, and years later they got married, and then they bring their kids to the same table again. Wow! You know, and say, hey. nice. yeah, I've got extended family uh, everywhere I go at conventions. It's any any actor that goes to conventions and has a bad attitude should just uh, take a pill, chill out, and and just know that if it wasn't for the fans, you know, you you wouldn't be working in, right. in a field that's so that's that can be so. Uh, um, so fantastic, and and uh, I, and I have fans. I'll ask them while I'm signing. I go, well, tell me a story. Tell me a joke. Yeah. Right. Uh, uh, or my favorite is this: if there's a couple, I'll ask uh, one 
well, who is your stalker? Should I call security? And then they go, oh, no, this is my wife. This is my husband. This is my boyfriend. This is my girlfriend. Uh, and, and it starts a conversation. And then while I'm, you know, doing my, my business, I, uh, I'll ask some questions. And, you know, how did you meet? Where were you? And, and the stories are always different, and it's, it's fantastic. You know, you name it from, well, I didn't like him at all till you know, I really finally realized that, you know, he's okay or she, or she this, that. It's just fun. It, it, people come to be in a giant get-together. It's like an extended family, you know, right. which is, which the conventions are fun. If you've never been to one, then I recommend, uh, go to a good convention. I, I recommend Cinema Wasteland. It's probably my favorite. Hey, Michael, Strongsville, Ohio. I have a question for you. Um, I'm ready to go. You've worked with some amazing producers. Is there a producer that you haven't worked with that you would really want to work with him or her? Oh, oh yeah. Uh, and why? Well, I, I, well, I really like uh, Joe Dante a lot. I, I know Joe. Uh, um, um, Matinee is probably one of my all-time favorite films. Uh, okay. And I know I'm not going to produce you yet, but I will. Um, uh, I would love to work with um, um, uh, uh, Roseanne's husband, John Goodman. Right. I would love to work on a role with John. And producer-wise, I think I would I would love to work with uh, um, uh, Josh Whedon. Okay, I've seen I've heard that I've heard that name. Yep. Big fan of Josh Whedon and big fan of Supernatural. Right. Yeah. Um. um how about that's some of my favorites that passed away. So it's right. Hard to <laughs> yeah, that's that. the, that's the problem with getting old, <laughs> you know. Well, you know, I mean, we we lost Wes uh, right. last year. Um, I was at his services in L.A. It was wonderful. Um, Jonathan, his son, was there, and we were at the Directors Guild. Uh, it was a wonderful, wonderful uh, memorial. It's a cute little Wes Craven story. When Wes is in the Northeast. Um, he he got invited by the president of the National Audubon Society to go out and go bird watching. So Wes went along, and they left early in the morning. They got to the the place where they could see some raptors, I guess they were. And the gentleman takes out some really nice Hasselbon long distance binoculars, and he goes, "Wes, look over there! It's such and such a bird." Wes, he said, Wes pulled out. A pair of opera glasses. <laughs> and Wes goes, where, where? And the guy starts laughing. He goes, here, try these. And uh, story goes, and Wes tried them, and he goes, whoa. The next weekend, Wes had a pair of, of those, you know. And and then he showed uh, Jonathan showed the photographs that Wes Craven had taken on on many many visits out to the wilderness to to uh, take pictures of uh, of birds. Wow. And uh, it was a side of West that you know most people are never aware of, but it was just lovely. And West had a passion for life. He had a passion for nature. He had a passion for humanity. He he was a, a just a quiet, soft-spoken, wonderful rascal, you know. And uh, um, God, that twinkle in his eye and that smile is just is just remarkable, you know. Wow. I remember like having Burt Lancaster, and he had the same twinkle in eye and smile. You know, but Wes was just absolutely uh, wonderful, wonderful. I don't, I don't think Wes Craven's done a bad movie, to be totally honest with you. And like Nightmare on Elm Street was amazing. Yes. Uh, I mean, like I said, Last House on the Left, I'm a big fan of that. Uh, you know, there was so many movies, especially his earlier ones, where, you know, it w he was trying to make a movie without a big Hollywood budget behind him. You know, I think they came out better, you know? Well, Serpent in the Rainbow was, uh, was oh, yeah, an no, interesting no. Trans transition. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, as far as uh, uh, business-wise, I mean, budget-wise, being um, being accepted by mainstream. It's funny they say Hollywood mainstream is this and that. Um, yeah. You know, um, I love the whole range of. Uh, a, a film. I, I'm a big, big fan. I do about six to eight uh, film festivals a year, the little ones, the indie ones, right? because they're just absolutely fun. There will be one coming out probably, I hope, before the end of the year. It's been 10 years in post. My dear friend Andrew Getty, who passed away, uh, I believe, last February, 
very dear friend. We worked on this film 10 years ago. It's called Storyteller. I am the storyteller. I'm a cadaverous entity that arrives via a portal to talk to uh, Dennis, whose brother is played by uh, Sean Patrick Flannery, who is engaged to Dina Myers. Okay. And it's a wonderful, creepy, beautifully crafted film. We showed it at the at the Sacramento um, Theater downtown, the Capitol Theater, uh, last year, and it was a sneak premiere, and the fans just loved it. It's uh, it's been finally edited uh, with musical score. It's in discussion right now as far as distribution. But be looking for it. Um, right, absolutely. You can probably Google it. But you won't get any new, new information yet because mm-hmm. we're still just at the point of um, you know, getting distribution happening. But it's a work of art, uh, storytelling. Mm-hmm. I look forward to that. Uh, yeah, look forward to that. Exciting. It's about a nightmare that uh, Andrew had, and um, he put it into script form. And... Um, it has a lot to do with uh, humanity and the human condition, so to speak. It, it's a wonderful dreamscape. It's beautifully crafted. So is, is that so, your favorite genre, like the sci-fi, that kind of yes, stuff? Yes. Uh, uh, I, I was very much influenced by Rod Sterling. Right, right. Before Rod Sterling as a, as a child, I, I, I loved the adventure of the... Uh, um, well, the guy that uh, Jack London stories and also the Edgar Rice Burroughs uh, works. My grandfather actually painted his house in Thousand Oaks. Wow. Oh, wow. Yeah. Everybody he said the room that, that Mr. Burroughs would go to to go to Africa and to write Tarzan, etc., he had him paint the entire room jet matte black. Wow. And wow. then the carpeting was crimson red. And all of the furniture was overstuffed with velour uh, chairs and sofas. So it was huh. red and black. That's bizarre. With lighting, of course. <laughs> and that's where he would go to write. Oh, really? So he, he likes like a In the jungle. That's where, that was his place to be in the proper frame of mind to create his art. Which uh, kind of stuck with me. I love Jules Verne also. Mm-hmm. Um, those are probably my favorites. I loved Outer Limits. Oh, yeah, One step absolutely. Front, all of that stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. Very, very uh, thought-provoking. Yeah, absolutely. Those stories. I mean, do you think they they do them justice when they take those stories and they make them into movies? I mean, you mentioned before that they end up, they have to cut a lot out of the story to make the movie, you know, a certain length, I guess. Yeah, well, Cuckoo's Nest, for instance, because mm-hmm. that was a novel. Uh, there was too much going on. Right. Uh, um. So, I mean, you can do, you know, time jumps, you know, through a film. But um, uh, I, I really think for young filmmakers and people that are, even if you're doing short subject um, projects, is to uh, really get down on paper, uh, know what it is, your beginning, middle, end. Know the range uh, of which you want to convey your story. Right. And then, and then fill it with as much richness as possible. I think the one, um, the one good thing you mentioned that you don't like high def that much, but the the fact that that equipment is now reasonably cheap, and now anyone that wants to make a movie can actually make it. Well, that is a definite plus, to, uh, technology wise. What I would recommend is, I'm sure that uh, what I mean by high def is, for instance, like. If you see someone holding a cigarette, you can see the ripples in the cuticle of the nail from their vitamin right. niacin. <laughs> you know, yep. it it just gets it, it it's distracting. Right. Mm-hmm. So I'm sure you could use filters, or uh, you can composite your lenses to the point where it's not that. You know, you're not a jeweler trying to read. You know, is it, where's the carbon fiber in the diamond? Right. I mean that's a pro- that that's a that's a carnival ride. That's not a story. That's not a movie. You know now. I mean, it, 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 you know, of course, if you're doing something that's just absolutely like a video game or something, mm-hmm. yeah, sure, fine. But I, I think film, in my opinion, film is is uh, available 
and should be availed for the purpose of telling a story. Mm-hmm. I think that some of the old movies, when they when they you know move to high def, it actually shows some of the faults and inconsistencies in it that you wouldn't have seen before because of the. Well, that's very true. Yeah. Uh, like for instance, if you took the, uh, um, the well, not the Turner classics, for instance, but if you took some of the old, you know, uh, Frankenstein, for instance, or right. even the original uh, King Kong. Of course, if you pump them up to high def, you're gonna. It's not gonna read as well. So, um, you know, uh, high def has its purpose in certain th- certain areas, but overall, I'd say uh, I think it, uh, takes away it can be a, a bit of a distraction. Yeah, but yeah, lighting, you can do so much with your lighting too. Right. To, uh, I, I mean, if I, it, whatever equipment you're gonna work with, um, use it to the best look because it's a visual medium. And so you have you have probably more control with a better budget instead of going 35, et cetera, and, mm-hmm. and having a huge budget. So I, I do appreciate the technology, but it, but the high def look to me is usually uh, not natural. And I yeah. think that's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, I think some people when they make movies, you know, back in the day, they knew the equipment, and they knew what it was going to look like on the screen. They didn't know what this new stuff was going to look like, and it wasn't going to come out like they wanted it to look. Well, it was projected too. Right. You're right. Yeah. It wasn't on uh, television. Didn't have movies for a long time. It yeah. was. It was studio. It was a, a, diff- a totally different medium. Yeah, I don't. I don't know how it was over here, but I remember in England a movie would come out, and then like six or seven years ago they'd show the movie at Christmas, and it would be the big movie. Like Crocodile Dundee came out six years ago, but now they're showing Crocodile Dundee. So you didn't. There was no vi- vi- videos in the 70s. There was no, you know, anything. So you, you How did you survive? <laughs> I, I I don't know. I I honestly don't know at this Porn. point. The work, yeah, no, there wasn't any of that either. That's what VHS VHS was developed for adult movies. But uh, no, the uh, you, you had to. Well, again, of course, of course, I've met I've met many people. Uh, a matter of fact, I did a movie with a guy who was a pioneer in that field. Right. And we did a a a wonderful kind of a Sweeney Todd movie. It's called Auntie Lee's Meat Pies. With uh. it was the last performance of my dear friend. Um, um, oh my God! Uh, you know, Wax, Pat Morita. Okay. Pat Morita is in it, and Terry Weigel and two other major uh, um, um, stars in the porn industry. Um, um, so, but you're right; it was developed for that, but. I've known a lot of people that have gone from that industry and, and on to other types of... Oh, absolutely. But all of the quality is what you're talking about, the, the graininess, the fuzziness. Right. It, you know, I mean, the only thing that's missing is the smell of vision where you, you, you smell, you know, uh, raunchy cigars or something <laughs> and bourbon. <laughs> you know that's going to come, right? That's going to happen. It's going to happen. Personally, I don't know... What I'm sure they have it now. I'm sure. I'm they're sure. T- they're actually talking about four, four-dimensional video where the fourth dimension is smell. Well, you know what they used to have in like some of these kid shows? They had scratch sniff cards. Oh, yeah, like remember smelly them? Smelly cards, yeah. And they would say, okay, now scratch off this. They I, would, like, give you I remember when I was a kid, they had a, a scratch card in the newspaper for a TV show. Yeah. They gave away 3D glasses, which those awful ones with the red and the green. Or red they were always awful. Yeah, yeah. And then they had a scratch card. It had like eight scratches on it, and it would come up on the bottom of the screen. It would say, scratch now, and you, sm- you, you do I'm it. That's what I'm talking about. They would be they would like have some that. awful smell. You know, I, but that's I, great. Yeah, I think yeah. that's great. That's, yeah. Well, that's that's what uh, 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 matinee, the John Goodman with the shock seats, you know, the electrical shock in the seats, Tingler and all that. Mm-hmm. Right. That was all part of the wonderful uh, campiness of of that type of uh, showmanship, which uh, I really love. It, it was an era. It, it was really cool. I'm a big fan of John Waters. If you want to talk about camp, <laughs> you know. Oh well, John's. Uh, I, I've I've not met John yet. We get along just fine. I mean, he's a character. Yeah, he's got definitely got. He's got some great stuff. I mean, I mean, does, I, I want to go back to you mentioned that you know you like you like living. You know the idea of living out in the woods and stuff. I read somewhere that you lived out in a like in a, a nature reserve sanctuary. for a long time. Is that true? Yes. If you go to the internet and you put in uh, Wolf Mountain Sanctuary. We'll come up with one that goes to Lucerne Valley, California, which is a really strange little desert town near a mountain where I used to live in Big Bear. Oh. It's a wolf sanctuary. It was founded by Tanya Carloni way back uh, many, 20, 30 years ago. And she uh, finds wolves that are uh, 
you know, have, uh, are in captivity that people have that should not have and are not being treated well. So it's a refuge, so they don't get put down. Oh. And teaches uh, the importance of wolves in, in nature and the natural order of things. I'm, I'm, I, was, I, I have two years of veterinary science uh, from right. the University of California, and I've always uh, appreciated uh, the natural world and the importance of uh, uh, how all of those systems work. The air, the water, the land, it's all very important. And, you know, I mean, these days we have, I consider fools, I won't, I'll be polite, not call them idiots, right. um, that, you know, deny, you know, climate change. Climate's always changed. And right. been, it's a no brainer. Yeah. Rivers, cut, rivers used to catch fire. Gee, can you figure out why yet? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Flint, Michigan. Gee, I don't know how to fix it. Yeah. Of course we know how to fix it. Well, you look at what about so, the the ice melting? You see the North Pole of the ice is melting at some incredible rate, you know, and the water's going to rise, and people are denying that, but it's pretty obvious it's going to happen at some point. Well, of course, of course, we know that fresh water and salt water have different buoyancy factors, and uh, uh, fish are leaving certain areas. Uh, I, if if I had a ton of money, I would not invest in fishing. The oceans are in peril. Right. Uh, nobody's talking about Fukushima and how 30% of the ocean in that area is dead. Wow. You know, uh, that's why when I was a young man, I, a uh, young boy, I used to read a lot of science fiction, especially futuristic. Mm -hmm. Those people were forward thinkers. Right. It would be like having uh, George Carlin and a scientist and a writer all combined giving you a cautionary tale before things get horrible. Well, guess what? We're at the point of horrible, yeah. and the only reason I give a shit is because uh, I have children, and, and there are friends of mine that have children, and their children are going to have children. Right. So they deserve a shot. I think it's scary and how the soon this stuff is going to And the only, way, the only way to acknowledge that is to be honest. Yeah. The only way to be honest is not to be bought and owned. Well, that's the whole and American if I, and, if, and if I take one right more there. step forward, we'll get into politics, and I don't want to go there. Yeah, really. <laughs> yeah, I, I, coming from England. That's just a nightmare in itself. Coming from England, looking at how the politics works in this country, I just don't understand the, the whole two-party system and, and how, you know, it's all about money and backhanders. And all that. I mean, yeah, like you say, don't want to get into it. I did a posting, uh, uh, someone did a posting on my behalf. Uh, I'll just sum it up this way. I mean... Uh, there was a time, um, you know, we had some really good words on paper. Yes, some, uh, uh, yes, uh, many nations got um, done wrong, Native American, indigenous people, for instance. But in general, what, what we had on paper to start a new world uh, government, et cetera, was representative government. And I remember you know, when I, many years ago, I've, I've met people and done things in business where I, I bump shoulders with the people that corporately run the world. And I saw maps of the world with no countries. This was 30 years ago, wow. kids. So, uh, yeah, it's a no-brainer. Long story short, as soon as like Citizens United was where corporations can, can buy influence, well, we've always known that happens at every level, but now it's official. Well, come on, it's a pretty stinking kettle of fish, don't you think? So at least they could be honest. So I remember talking to somebody at a convention one day, and I was doing one of my little polite rants, and I said, I wish Congress would have everybody wear a NASCAR driver's suit, and all of the corporations that give them money that actually tell them how to vote because they don't listen to us because we don't give them money, and then they have to wear a patch. And lo and behold, one day on my Facebook page, it's way down many pages below where it is today, there is a reference of a picture of John Bonner uh. wearing a NASCAR suit with patches all over his suit of all uh. the global <laughs> corporations that, that hold the strings to these puppets. Wow. That's yeah. not the kind of representative government that, that we deserve and that, that our Constitution says that we are supposed to have and serve and protect with our children's blood. So that being said, I think it goes back to your local zip code and your local neighborhood. If everybody took care of their own backyard and and just said, no, I'm not going to go purchase certain things at giant stores at outsourcing right. sector, there would be changes. Absolutely. You, you know, and okay. In the meantime, yes, I love the natural world very much. 
I don't know if you want to. I don't think it should be. I was say, I don't, yeah, know if you I don't think wanna... it should be put in a zoo. Like Joni Mitchell was one of my mentors. I got to meet her many mm-hmm. years ago at the Troubadour. And she was doing a sound check at three in the afternoon with my buddy from high school. We skipped class to go meet her. And uh, some of her lyrics are just like, wow. Okay, <laughs> I get it. Right. Some of that 60s you know, so stuff sounds dated. Again, to art, stuff. art leads the way. Right. What are your feelings on Trump? Trump's not taking any money, but he's a bit of a cartoon character too, though, right? Oh, I'm not even going to go there. <laughs> I don't blame you. <laughs> I mean, it's obvious. It's so obvious. I'm not even. I'm not even going there. Right. At least, the only thing yeah, I like I mean, about it is, is the part that he's not taking money from people. Forget about the rest of it. But at least he's not taking money from people. So that doesn't mean anything. That just means he has a bigger ego. Ah, okay. It's not a, mm-hmm. it's not a good thing. Hello. Right. Oh, he has a huge. Think ego. about it. Yeah. Oh well, yeah. It's just How, huge. You know, it's it's just more ego. Right. That's I mean. What do you think? The you think they're there to serve you, and no. to honor the Constitution? No. Yeah, right. They're there to help themselves. Exactly. They're all out <laughs> you know? themselves. Well, you go. Yeah. So that's about an hour, gentlemen, yes. ladies. If you could, if you could just do one thing for us, can you just uh, make a little bumper for us? Just say, you know, this is Mike Michael Berryman, and you're listening to the Dysfunctional Podcast. That would be really, really cool. I can do that right now. Go ahead. All right. Hey, kids out there in Radio Land, you're listening to Dysfunctional Podcast, and I am Michael Berryman. Cool. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It was an honor You're to have you on our show. You're very welcome. It was very nice speaking with you. I'm, so, I'm just surprised you had time to talk to us because on IMDb, it shows you have 17 movies in production right now. Is that true? Well, that's what IMDb says. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, 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 um, I'm not going to uh, – I, I how do you say it? I will not uh, – um, they'll, they'll take the fifth. Yeah. <laughs> when you say I won't, I won't say it's true, but I won't say it's not true. I, right. won't, I won't deny or confirm. Uh, I forget the other word. Confirm. Um, yeah. It could be. It could be the case. Wow. I know. I know. I'm working when I have a plane ticket. Right. <laughs> Looking at this, you're never. And home. all you a- and all you actors out there, just remember that pile of scripts on your desk will wind up on the shelf, will wind up in a box, will wind up in the recycle, and then it might come back to life at a later date. My point is. Take one day at a time. Take care of yourself. Love your friends and family. And God bless. God bless. Thank you so much, Michael. We really, really appreciate it. Big fan since Weird Science. Wishing it's you all great. the best. <laughs> You're very welcome. It's been a lot of fun. Right, thank, you thank you very you much, so much, sir. Enjoy your weekend. Thank you. Yeah, have a great weekend.